Hello, everyone. Welcome back to today's podcast. My name is Brittany Simon. In today's podcast, I want to discuss dating a broke boy. Before we jump in, I am drinking a tea today. This is from our local tea shop here in Croatia. This is Robos, 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 and Honeybush. I will link in the description this particular tea because I just learned about it today and I thought it was a little interesting. So I will link it down below. It basically tastes like a like a very just like earthy, planty tea. That is my favorite kind of tea. So anytime I'm at the tea shop, I'm just going to go for something like grounded and earthy. And I definitely think this is it. So links down below for more information on it because I just learned about it today and I thought it was interesting. Okay. So today this podcast was inspired by Netflix show Love is Blind because of Stacey and Izzy's relationship. I covered in a live show about Love is Blind. I'm not going to do a podcast on it. I just feel like this is a little bit more interesting as to use that as a jumping off point to talk about something that I think is very interesting and that is dating a broke boy. What does it mean to date somebody who's broke and what does broke mean? So Okay. In order to have this conversation, I want to talk about maybe something a little bit uncomfortable, which is not just money, but what it says about you when you do or do not have money or specifically the relationship you have with money. You know, I come from a lower middle class, middle class living. My parents were immigrants. They had 10 kids. My dad owned his own business, you know, and we struggled with money sometimes, but the kids mostly didn't feel it. I think the only way that it was communicated to me that I didn't grow up with money is because we had, um, you know, generic clothes and hand-me-down clothes for my cousins and we couldn't afford anything name brand, sure. Like I remember when the scooters came out and my friends all had like the name brand scooter and we got the generic scooter from Costco or my friends got Ugg boots and I got Costco boots. And so I understood sort of that I wasn't a rich kid, but I also understood that I wasn't in poverty. Now my parents... I think my mother in particular, you could argue that she came from poverty, but it's a little bit different because they're immigrants from Iraq. It's a little bit of a different context of what it means to be poor. But my father comes from Baghdad, from Iraq, and his family was engineers, so they had money, and his mother worked, so they had money. But my mom's family came from a village called Elkush, and they come from more like you know, no electricity or running water in the house, you know, so they're having a different lived experience. But at the same time, I don't think anyone looked down on my mother's family. I think they were seen as people who were, I don't know, village people, just like nice people who lived in a village and they did village people things. I don't, I don't know if growing up, I thought of them as bad because they grew up not in the city, but I'm sure there was some classism being played even in Iraq because humans going to human, right? So when they immigrated to America and they got married here and met up again here, they knew each other as children and then met up again as adults and they got married, their, their life was like being sort of in love with no money. My parents sort of work together. They're a team. When they had no money, like when I was born and I my first crib was like a dresser drawer, you know, that's the story they always tell. It was like, I'm in love and look at us being in love and having babies and figuring out our careers. And at the time, my mom was pretty successful in Mary Kay. She had like won a car and a ring and met Mary Kay herself and gone to the mansion. And then she decided to be a stay-at-home mom and my dad like got his, you know, his stuff together and became not an apprentice anymore, but a real engineer. And the story is sort of romantic. Like we had no money and it was sort of like hard, but romantic. And I think because my parents have so much gratitude considering where they've come from, you know, it's a little bit different, but there was sort of a romance around us not having money. And then it was like, look what we've built for ourselves. And now my parents have a house that's paid off in California. It's a beautiful home. You know, my dad's done a lot of work to it, to be fair, himself. Like my parents could never afford to hire a contractor to necessarily come in. They would have to like, you know, pay for their own blueprints to get their own approvals, to do their own building up. Like my parents had to go the cheaper route. Like, oh, you could hire a guy to put in tile or my dad could do it himself. Do you know what I'm saying? So my dad sort of saved money over the years by doing it himself. But that was also a sign that we didn't have lots of money to pay someone else to do it. It's very expensive to get people to do it. And so I kind of grew up with these 90s like home improvement dads or dad. I grew up with this 90s home improvement dad where he was like, I'll do it myself. It's cheaper. But that's also an indication of where you are in terms of class. Um, I think there's this um, at least association where I come from in my bubble that if you 
can pay someone to do it, you're probably like softer around the edges. And my dad was a little rougher on the edges because he did it all himself. I remember when I was really young and my dad was doing um, electrical work in the house and he hit a, he hit something wrong and it started a little fire in the attic and he was like, Brittany, 911. And like I went to go call 911 as they were all running and getting the kids out of the house and the phone was dead. And so I slammed the phone on the ground because I was so anxious and I ran across the street to my bestie's house and I was like, call 911, call 911. And it was fine. It was no big deal. The house didn't burn down. But it was one of those memories that I have growing up where my dad did it himself. And then my other friend's parents, like they had lots of money just sitting around. So if anything happened, they threw $20,000 here and $10,000 here and twenty. you know, they just threw money around, right? Even though they made it clear that it was very difficult and they saved for that money, they also had it to begin with. They were kind of more upper, upper middle class, I would say. So as I'm watching Love is Blind and I'm watching Stacy and Izzy have these conversations and you don't have to watch the show to know the context, but basically Izzy comes from a poorer background and Stacy comes from an upper middle class background and she owns a house and he doesn't and she has a stable job and he doesn't. And to be fair, her stable jobs, we're not sure if that like is her independent living, how much help she gets from her dad. Apparently she does rely on her dad from what I saw from the show to some extent versus like if something went wrong with my house and I don't own a home, but let's say I owned a home. It's not like I could call my parents to be like, hey, can you help me with my AC unit? Okay, like my parents are okay now for themselves, barely, right? They raised 10 kids. I don't come from a background where I could call my parents to help me with my house. Like that's their house. Like, you know what I'm saying? They already have their own bills. So Stacy implied during the show that she could call her dad for help which is lovely. That's such a blessing, but it's very different, right? So as I'm watching this show, there was a lot of judgment about whether or not Izzy was good enough to date Stacy because of how much money he made. Now, minus the other things, the fact that he lied to her on the show about his credit cards or why he didn't have credit cards because his credit was bad, or the fact that honestly his work wasn't stable and he kind of gave me the impression that he wasn't career motivated or minded and just didn't want to admit that. His exterior comes off very like masculine, but he's actually kind of a bottom. And I think that he would do well in a relationship where the woman sort of wore and he was a stay-at-home husband or something like that. He's obviously not career-minded, right? And I think that's okay. I think in society we need to be start we start we should be open to the idea that our partners might not be career-minded, meaning they can hold down jobs, they can they can pay their rent, but they're not like motivated to like I want to I want to do things. You know what I'm saying? It's very different that mindset. And I think those partners probably go well together. Now, what I did is I sat down with myself and I said, why is it, why does Izzy give people the ick in terms of his money? And I actually don't think it's how much he makes or doesn't make. I think it's his attitude towards it. If Izzy owned the fact that he wasn't career minded, if he was like, yeah, you know, I just get a job to pay the bills. I'm not actually like motivated to work. I just have to work because we're all adults and we all have to work. I think there would be less judgment and more openness to people like Izzy. You know what I mean? Again, minus all his trauma, which he has to go to therapy for, and minus all the way that he grew up a Jehovah Witness and never had a Christmas until recently, minus all of the details. I don't think any of us actually have a problem with our partners not being motivated by work, since I think a majority of people probably aren't that motivated to work. We just do it because we have to pay our bills, right? Now, for me, I work seven days a week, and I love my job, and this is my job, and I'm really happy to do it. I would work as much as I needed to, to make sure that this is always my living. Like that's kind of my philosophy is this feels like a blessing to me. I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. My dad always knew he raised me to run a business. Like this was always going to be my life. It was just a matter of how do I do it? And you know, there's, there's this uh, stereotype that entrepreneurs actually work like a hundred hours a week and make what somebody would make working 40 hours a week. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes, you know, you do end up making far less, but the independence is worth it. I think Mark Cuban said that he'd rather be making 50K a year working for himself than 70K working for somebody else. And I kind of believe in that mindset as well for myself. But I'm also in a situation where I do want to be the breadwinner. I do want to prioritize my career. I would like a partner that helped me do that. And I would like a partner who was in my life. So I don't want a partner who's also prioritizing their career because they'll never be home and I'll never be home and we'll never see each other. 
there's always this conversation we have around don't date a broke boy. But I think what you mean to say is don't date somebody who has a bad relationship with money and don't date somebody that's lying about their relationship with money. Because the truth is, is most Americans are broke. Most of y'all are in debt. Most of us have like credit card debt. They're set like we are broke. We don't have money. And so I think I think. I think I want to be more honest about the conversation and say, like, most of us are broke. Um, and by broke, I mean, we're not going to buy houses as millennials. We're struggling as it is. I don't know how you guys are doing, but if you look at the statistics, like, we're not we're not doing great. You know, some of us are doing better than others and some of us are managing, but we're not doing great. So I would argue that we're all broke. It's just our relationship with money is more tolerable to people. It is more tolerable to people to be broke but have three jobs and you're, you know, paying down your credit card debt of 80K. Or it is more tolerable to make no money but you don't have any occurring debt. You know, it's – we accept broke just on a spectrum. And so I want to sort of put it out there that – it's not about should you date a broke boy. It's about whether or not you should date somebody who has a bad relationship with money. And I don't think you should have date somebody who has a bad relationship with money. What does that mean to have a bad relationship with money? So then I was thinking about it. And I think it is sort of the lying, the ego, the 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 attitude around money. Because look, the reason I'm pointing it out about broke boys and not broke girls is because we actually grew up in like a patriarchy in America and men don't mind dating broke girls. Because men always assume that their their income would be the primary income. So there is no conversation around dating broke girls because women have always been broke. We haven't had money. Men haven't always allowed us to have jobs. And now that women are working and becoming the breadwinners, I think it's men's opportunity to say, I maybe would like to be the stay-at-home partner or the stay-at-home dad. Or maybe I would like to be less career-driven. And I think the women that are super career driven, I think they could really benefit from having a partner who supports them and takes care of the household, takes care of the kids, you know, does everything else. I think there's some some shift in culture that's happening that could benefit us all if we didn't have such a toxic mindset around broke. Because again, this idea of don't date a broke boy, I think, again, people have toxic relationships with money and or, right? People forget that women have been the broke girl this whole time. So I'm kind of open to a shift in culture personally. Now, I came across this TikTok recently that stood out to me. And it was a rapper. And he was really successful. But he worked at a grocery store. And I don't know who this man is. I I just came up. He came across my feed. And I'll link it in the description. You guys can check it out. But it really stood out to me that the interviewer is asking him, like, why do you work at a grocery store if you have all this money? And he said, oh, I want to, I'm a single dad. I'm raising kids. And I want them to know the value of work. I want them to see that I can, that what work is. And that was so attractive to me. I was just like, wow, that's really great. Like, I love that. I love that he has money, but chooses to work to be an example for his children. There's something so powerful about that. Now, I know um, through a friend, this really wealthy, wealthy person who has like generational wealth. His parents never worked a day in their life, never had to work. He works and he works in the arts. And so when I look at his family and their setup, yeah, he never had a role model that taught him what work was. And that is so it's so strange to me, right? Because I didn't grow up like that. I'm sure you didn't grow up like that. But here are the two different bubbles, right, giving two different examples of what it means to raise a child. One parent or two parents decide never to give their child an idea of what work is, and so the child has to figure it out on their own. And then one parent decides to raise these children and give them a good example of a working parent. That is really, really lovely, right? Now, I know some of you are saying, oh, well, this rapper probably has money, and so he can have the luxury of, like, choosing to work. We all choose to work. Ultimately... Truly, like I, because I think we're just evolved animals on a planet. I think our species is just here in the same way that a bear is here or a plant is here. And because I believe that, you know, we don't exactly choose to be born. We're just like thrown into the world. Every time you have a child, you are putting that burden on them, which is why I'm trying to tell people, like, if you think life is hard and you don't want to pay taxes, why are you having children? Because you're having children and basically saying, hey, I'm suffering. Now you're going to suffer. So before you have a child and before you decide, you know, what kind of a person you're going to be in the world. 
or what kind of a parent you're going to be in the world. You have to say what kind of person you're going to be in the world. And I think it is better to be a person that has a good relationship with money and sort of creates your own bubble around it. So again, should you date a broke boy? More like, should you date someone with a bad relationship with money? I don't want to date somebody who thinks life is suffering and awful. Let me have a baby. I don't want to date that person. I don't want to date somebody that's like, wow, life is so hard. Everything is a struggle. Let me make four babies. You're not very responsible with your money. That's a bad relationship with money. Children cost money. You are bad with money, but you're human and you're making these decisions because honestly, I get it. Like humans are going to human, right? But I really highly recommend that we also face ourselves the uncomfortable truth that we're bad with money when we have children when life is already hard enough. Children are money. It's like getting a car with a thousand dollar payment every month. Only it's a kid with its own consciousness and now it has to suffer in the world. So again, when I hear people say, oh my gosh, I would never date a guy who makes less money than me. Why? I understand if he has a bad relationship with money, but it sounds like you might have a bad relationship with money. When Stacy says, oh, I want a guy who makes more than me, so I don't rely on my dad. I want to fight first class. Everything about me is fancy. She's just conveying to me that she has a bad relationship with money. That's what I'm hearing. I'm more of a Graham Stephan fan, right? Like I feel like you should make your coffee at home even if you are making millions of dollars. But it's not a should, like I'm, I'm not moralizing it. I'm not saying you're a bad person. I just think for Brittany, it makes me wonder where your priorities are. You know what I mean? When you feel a need to live a certain way and then force other people to live that way. Same with being poor or with rich. Let's say you're Stacy and you're really wealthy and you want your husband to live that lifestyle, but you go on a show called Love is Blind and you're dating mostly people who don't have money. Like what was the thought process there, right? Now, if you're Stacy though and you are open to dating somebody who makes less than you, then we don't have a problem. But that was clear that wasn't her goal, right? On the other side, the problem that I saw with Izzy is that he was poor. And I, by poor, I mean like, you know, the rest of us struggling paycheck to paycheck, wasn't sure where his, you know, how much money he would make, not sure where his career was going. And he kind of fluffed it. He lied. He basically said like, oh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to my job. I, I really think it's going to make. He fluffed his resume to win Stacy over. And Stacy was right to call him out on that because you shouldn't fluff your relationship with money, right? Like one of the jokes my husband and I always say is like, oh, I make money, but I'm not worth anything because I have debt. Like I have debt. I might make money, but I haven't spent my life being financially savvy. I've spent my life having a bad relationship with money. I wanted to unalive myself for most of my existence since I was like eight years old, all the way until 30. I was pretty sure I was going to unalive myself. So what was the point in having a good relationship with money? Um, during COVID, I think I started COVID off with like $60,000 of debt and then paid it all off, zero. And now I'm in debt again, just a little bit because I owe the IRS money as a YouTuber. I'm not in the place right now with my YouTube career where I'm paying next year's taxes ahead of time. Like I'm not there yet. I don't make enough money to actually pay next year's taxes, but I will. I think I will make enough money in the next two to three years because – I know it sounds really funny, but because I don't own a company, because again, I like privacy and there's a whole thing around it. It also costs money up front to start these things. It's very like interesting how it all works. And I'm not ready to have that relationship with money where I understand everything. So I'm just kind of like figuring it out as I go. That is a big burden to sort of marry someone into, but I'm lucky that my partner is like better with money and that we can have these conversations about money and that, you know, he can focus on the household and doing his thing and I can work seven days a week and make money and then we can live very frugally and figure out our life and sort of like have this. Now, we don't live like beans and rice frugally, okay? Like I eat well and I refuse to eat less than that, but we also live less than the average American, 100%. The average person I talk to, I'm spending way less in comparison and a big part of that is that we cook our food. And I think we are saving a lot of money on that. A lot of people my age group who eat out spend like $1,500 a month on takeout to $2,000. I don't know where y'all are, are. I cannot do that. Now, we work from home. I work from home. So to be fair, he cooks and does everything. And then if I feel like cooking, I will. But like we're at home all day. So we have that luxury. My friends who work out of the office, they are spending like 2 k a month on food. So, you know, for me, when I look at that, 
I don't know that I'm comfortable with that sort of lifestyle, but it's a lifestyle you can have. You can have whatever lifestyle you want because this is like the game of life. You get to decide, you know, depending on your circumstance. But when you have a relationship with money that allows you opportunity and you don't take it, that's also the relationship you're having with money, right? And I think that that's what's so uncomfortable about this conversation. Even for me, I'm like so uncomfortable is that ultimately not all of us are in this amazing position. You know what I mean? Like my parents weren't the most financially literate growing up. So I had to learn it the hard way. Even now I'm still learning and I'm behind my peers or the image of what I think my peers are doing. But if you look at the statistics of what America is going through, it seems like we're all in the same boat. We're all kind of figuring it out. We're all trying to get our first 10K saved. We're all trying to do, you know what I'm saying? So again, I think it's easy to get down on ourselves, but unless you come from actual money, most of us are just trying to figure it out. So I don't think it's wrong to date somebody who's broke because what is broke if we're all in debt? Like we're all broke. But I think what's important is that you date somebody with a plan and with an honesty around that plan, right? I think it's important you date somebody and have a conversation with somebody that says, hey, this is my plan. I want to build up my YouTube channel. I want to build up my insurance company. I want to build up my job at the school. I want to be a a principal. Oh, I actually want to stay a teacher and this is all I'll ever make. And like, oh, I want to be a stripper. Like I want to, whatever their plan is, they have to be honest about it. I remember I read this article about this, uh, like a, a help, like help me with my relationship article. And the guy said, I'm dating a girl. We're both financially set. We both have good careers and we're engaged. We're about to get married in like a month. And she sits me down and says, hey, I would like to be a stay-at-home partner. And he's like, what do you mean? Because if you become a stay-at-home partner, we have to lower our like our lifestyle. Like, we, I can't afford our lifestyle and just our income. And she goes, yeah, but I want to be a stay-at-home partner and I want to do arts and crafts and I want to follow my dreams. And he was like, oh, like I'm not comfortable with this. I'm thinking about canceling the wedding. And she's like, why? And this really stood out to me as a red flag because basically in that moment, she's not being a team player. She's being all about her and her career instead of having a conversation with him saying, hey, like I want to change our lifestyle a little bit. How do you feel about that? Like I know for me, I told my partner, like I've worked really hard. I'm happy to get another job. I'll work as many jobs as it takes, but I don't want to lower down the lifestyle that I'm living because I can't go back to like rat infested apartments and like apartments with like old stains on the carpet and I can't go back to living in apartments where you know I've lived in so many bad apartments and I just I can't go back (laughs) to living in that I need to be able to afford a nice place and within budget right I'll I'll literally get 10 more jobs to do it and that's sort of my thinking I'll I'll work as many jobs as it takes to not have to go back because I've been there I've been zero dollars in my account I've it's such a struggle and I don't want to go back And so when I talked to my partner about this, I was like, we could get a cheaper apartment, but I, the cheaper apartments are in a state of like, I can't go back to like possible mold or ants or any, like I can't go back to anything that conveys to my brain, like we're going backwards. I need to go forwards. And again, we're going for cost efficiency. So I'm paying less for this place than I was paying for my townhouse in Arizona when I rented there. So at least I'm saving money and I got a higher quality of life. Now I did move countries to get it, but you know, a girl's willing to do what she has to do. So I did, I moved countries to get that. In order for me to maintain my quality of life for cheaper, I had to move countries. That's why we moved to Croatia. Now my partner's from here, but he could have come to the U.S., But there was no way for us to live in the U.S. at the same quality of life without spending more money than I was willing to spend. We made a financial decision to live here. Living in Croatia was a financial decision and everything just made more sense living here. It's prettier. It's gorgeous. It gives us more access, gives him an education process if he wants to do that. It gives me opportunities to do my job in a fun way. Like it just gave us so many more benefits. Healthcare, food was cheaper and better quality. There was just so many benefits. Now, not everybody could do this, though anyone, and this is the uncomfortable part, I'm going to say this out loud, anyone with just enough middle class understanding of the world could do what I'm doing. 
You could be a digital nomad. You could be a nanny overseas. You could do so many things, but you have to have the knowledge. And to be honest with you, I had more or less the connections because I had people in my life who had done it or knew what to do or worked for different agencies and they could help me. So to be honest with you, also growing up a little bit middle class gives you networking connections. And to be honest with you, it is true. Like if you're born into the poverty bubble, it is very difficult to meet those networking connections in the same way that when you're in the middle class bubble, it can be still difficult to meet the other networking connections, right? And so when you're in the game, you have to decide like what bubble am I, you have to know, you have to acknowledge what bubble am I born into and what's the game I can play here? Because to be honest with you, like it would be very difficult for me to have done this if I was born in in a different place, right? So you got to do with what you can do with what you can do with. But there is a possibility. There is a way out of everything. You just got to get the right information. So tool gathering, and then you have to have the motivation to do it. But if you look at America and the way that it's going, I don't think people have the motivation to always get out of those situations, right? Now, for the most part, I think we're all doing it to the best of our ability. Absolutely. But it is really hard. And so a part of me like empathizes and a part of me is like my survival gene is like, I will not go back. So I will work as many jobs as possible, right? It's not easy, but it's also easier than my ancestors had to deal with. My life is easier than my parents' life was Um, in some ways, obviously mostly because they were immigrants because the reality is, is my parents could afford a house when I won't be able to in America, even though I'm making about the same amount of money my dad was making when he bought his first home, doesn't matter, right? So Some things are harder and easier. I just think my quality of life is better than my parents was growing up, especially in Iraq. And for that, I am grateful. So again, would I date a broke boy? What is broke is really the question. And how do I not qualify for broke when I'm in debt, right? But my relationship with money is one of, it's switched over the years. And I think that's the key is I might be in debt, but I know I'll be out of it. And I know my relationship with money is getting better and I know I'm having a better and healthier relationship by not impulse spending it every moment of every day. Because let me tell you girls, when I was in the height of my depression, the height of my borderline, the height of my anxiety, what would give me a sense of control? Spending money. Literally. In my 20s, when I was in the height of mental health, when I was wanting, every time I wanted to unalive myself, if I just bought something, the, the dopamine would hit my brain and I'd be like, okay, I don't have to die today. I get it. I get it, right? There's something really lovely. Oh, I'll shave my hair. I'll dye it. I'll spend 10 grand on nothing. It wasn't 10 grand at a time. It'd be like over, it's like four years, I'd spend like 15 grand on nothing, just like Starbucks and shoes and just nothing, just nothing, you know? So again, would you date a broke boy? What is a broke boy, right? I want to date somebody who has a good relationship with themselves, a good relationship with their money, a good relationship with their spirituality, a good relationship. I want to date healthy. And healthy people are sometimes poor, right? So I think that's really the focus is we want to date healthy people. Now, one more story. Okay. You guys see the TikTok of the girl. I don't know if this was uh, acted out. Abin Preach covered it. I don't know if this was fake. Maybe they got us. But the lady who was upset that the man took her to Cheesecake Factory, I grew up middle class. Cheesecake Factory is fine. It's not the best quality of food, but I mean, it's okay. Like, I don't, like it's, it's, I don't know. It's like going to the macaroni grill or um, what's another sit down chain restaurant. It's just California Pizza Kitchen. I love California Pizza Kitchen. Chicken piccata every time, girl. So like in my mind, when you're dating middle class and it's like a first date, who cares if you go even if you're dating a millionaire, like why would I care if they took me as long as the food is bomb? Like, okay, in Croatia, there are bomb mom and pop restaurants here and it's like 11 euro for like a meal. And yes, maybe in that original video, she was upset that it was a chain restaurant. And I understand that to an extent because I don't traditionally eat at chain restaurants because I do think the quality of food isn't as good, but I also wouldn't complain if somebody was taking me out on a date. Because like I Cheesecake Factory still 
fine. Hell, I'm going to be real with you. I'm the kind of girl that like thinks a walk on the beach is like a good date or like a Starbucks drink is a good date. Like I, I just think a first date is you getting to know somebody and you're mostly talking. So the food quality doesn't matter. What matters is that it's a vibe. And so if you wanted to take me and you said, hey, do you want to get like burritos and go walk on the beach? <laughs> yes, that sounds awesome. Now, again, I'm a little bit low maintenance. Uh, to be real with you, I don't care about these things. I also would like a home cooked meal and I wouldn't care if you served it on a paper plate. Like I am. I don't know. I'm very low maintenance in this regard. I just want to fall in love, which I did, obviously. But I want to fall in love with a good person who has a good heart and has a good character and has a good relationship with themselves and the world around them. I want a good person, a wholesome, lovely human to spend my life with. And that person might be broke and might take me to the Cheesecake Factory, might take me on a walk on the beach, might never afford to buy me Versace or Gucci or whatever. And I'm going to love them anyways, because the truth is I will also probably never afford to buy him Gucci or him Versace. Let's be real, girls. I am also a poor girl who makes good money. I make good money for a middle class person. I'm still in debt. I'm still living paycheck to paycheck like everybody else. And I'm still grateful to be here because life's pretty good even when you're not upper middle class, even when you're not wealthy. How many unhealthy, unhappy wealthy people we got to see to know that money is not the answer to happiness, girl? Okay. It's just not. So these girls on TikTok that are going viral complaining that men aren't paying for them, Stacy, who says like, you're the man, you have to pay for dinner. I don't know, girl. Sounds stressful. I'm out. Sounds stressful. Okay. That's my podcast. Thank you for watching. I really do appreciate it. I'd love to hear your opinions. I know money's very uncomfortable. It makes me so uncomfortable because people aren't always born into opportunities. And I know that I was born into better opportunities because my dad had a business and I had networking possibilities and they were immigrants, which means when they came here, they hustled harder because I grew up in the bubble where the immigrants hustle harder. And so, you know, that's a very stereotypical, um, you know, background. Like that's a privilege in a way, right? Like I was just given so many opportunities to learn how to make money. And so I, again, like I will work 10 jobs to work for myself versus one job working for somebody else. And that's the life that I've chosen. It's stressful, but girl, it's worth it. You know, not everybody wants to do it. And that's smart. My brother actually, during COVID, one more story, sorry, during COVID, he tried to work for himself and realized it was too stressful and went right back to working for somebody else. Everyone is built different. Play to your strengths. Everyone is built different. Play to your strengths. Don't let the bubble shame you for playing to your strengths. You feel me? Okay, I will talk to you guys next week. I can't wait. Oh, and let me know if you guys ended up researching this tea and if you guys end up getting it and liking it. Again, I super like it. I put no sweetener in this tea and I do recommend it. It's really yummy. Yeah. Okay, talk to you guys soon. Bye. In my head, in real life, I'm dead. My belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine. Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense. I've been nothing but blessed. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking. Yeah, I'm sick of breathing.